materials uh, may, matched up with people who have, for example, familiarity of the material and can match it all together and make it work. What I can offer you is, in the short term, I, I think I would get a notice up on U of U in calling for skills on this as a specific project and see if you can get some people from the dip, wherever they are to help you achieve this in the short term. So I'd get a forum note up or something up on U of U um, straight away. In the medium term, like in the next few weeks, when we get these workbenches up, then I'm hoping that you will be able to um, better <clears throat> organise those things at a community level. Um, but yeah, I think it's a great idea. And I think uh, hopefully in the short term, on you of you, you will get people responding to you directly if you put your email up there and saying, yeah, let me help you with the pamphlet or let me help you distill the material. I'm sure people would love to help you with that. Okay, um, thank you. Um, I've got one more question and I'll, I'll get off here. Uh, okay, yeah. so what about the campus forms, the forms, the documents about creating the campus um, campuses and stuff? Have you gotten those completed yet and up on the website? They're not up on the website. They are, they are completed, but I, I, I've held back purely to make sure the workbench is running. Some of it will be electronic. Some of it will be, well, and then all of it will be ultimately PDF. Um, I, I assure you that the forms to, to, to formalise the campuses, and the reason we have forms to formalise the campus is the campus actually holds the seat of power of Eucadia. The campus is, the, each campus is its own foundation stone. So the, the, the instruments to formalise are extremely important because, for example, the money system is actually at a campus by campus level. Each campus will then need to have its own trust account uh, for the exchange uh, of UK money out to the local community and vice versa. So um, give me the week and a half now confirming the workbenches are running by next week. All right? Okay. Um, I guess that's it. I'll let you go to... Um to um, answer some questions. And Ray, uh, give me a call tomorrow, Ray, uh, and we'll talk to you later there, um, Frank. On up. Okay. Thank you so much. And I, it was a wonderful present, and I was honoured to receive it. And, uh, it's, uh, and it's beautiful maple syrup. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks You're very welcome. Much. You're welcome. Um, let, me, uh, let me get... Uh, on to a couple more questions on the chat, and then I know that uh, Ron is waiting patiently there to, to speak. Uh, we've got a few more minutes before we will finish, so if anyone else wants to speak live, just speak uh, star eight and look forward to answering your question and hearing from you. Um, the next question in the chat is uh, guest 50 saying, uh, why are these elite banking families immune from prosecution? Uh, that is an excellent question. And I wish people would ask that question more often of President Obama and other members of Congress and the Senate, as well as asking that of elected leaders in Europe. The short answer is, and, and, and I hope Guest 50 realises the, the answer to why the elite banking families are immune is that it is the banking families that ultimately uh, claim ownership of uh, the private corporations and network since the 19th century. We, we don't have time tonight, but I think it will be uh, and it would be a useful chat to kind of give you the context of how things unfolded from Rudolf Habsburg and, uh, and uh, uh, Edward Longshanks in England and um, Gregory and how they set up the um, survey camera, the serfs of the, of the treasury, how they basically uh, rendered uh, all commerce in, in the world um, over to the Venetian parasite families, uh, Genovese parasite families and then how that evolved to basically them controlling all finance by rendering usury a crime 
punishable by death. And then how by the 19th century, these families that were quote-unquote serving the Vatican had their own coup d'etat and uh, bankrupted the kingdom or, kingdom or the British Empire and then used that as a leapfrog to then claim uh, a new system, a corporate system uh, of ownership. So it would be worth to go through that because then you can see how the power shifted and changed and, and who's who in the zoo today. But uh, a very good question. Um, let me um, take Ron on the call and then I'll keep going through the questions in the chat. Thanks for everybody. Let's see if we can get Ron. Ron, can you hear us? Hi, Frank. Frank, you there? I am. Good. Um, as you know, the the entry into the court system is either with a summons or with an indictment. And in my case, that the indictment was served like in June of 10, 2010. Would it yeah. would it be advisable for me to do a create a rejection notice, glue it to the back, then use that as an exhibit for a like a rejection notice in their court format. I think you've just answered the, the, the missing link that we're talking about. Let me just add a couple of things quickly. Uh, why are we gluing things to the back of their documents? Let me just answer that. The rhetorical, you, you know the answer to this, but right. just for the call. Um, they say that uh, if unless it's a public document, they can't see it. I mean, this is an absurdity but it's the same as the kids saying, I can't see you. I mean, it's just, it's childish. But, <clears throat> hey, it's a one-sided game. They want to play the game. We can play the game. So the front page of the indictment is, uh, even a copy of it, is recognised as a public document, even a copy, yeah? Mm -hmm. They have no problems with copies. They make copies of things all the time. They don't give us originals, so they don't have a problem with copies. <laughs> extracts or whatever you want to call it. Um, when you do that, what you have from the very beginning of paper documents is you have the reverse. I suggest to anyone on the call still, go and have a look at the um, canons, positive law. Go and have a look at document under positive law. You'll see the definition of, of reverse. It's worth reading. It gives you an insight into documents. You need to know this. Article 22 of positive law Go and look at document. <clears throat> so when you take your private document and you strongly bind it, strong bound glue to one page of their document, then what you have done is you have made your private document public because it is now intimately part of the document. Now this is legitimate. This is not magic or some weird thing I assure you they are well aware of this. This is a, a, a rare, rare historical element fundamental to the very nature of what is a document. They can't reject it because the back of a document is called the reverse, the rejection. So I think your idea of going back to the unrebutted presumption of the indictment, yep. yeah, and using that as a vehicle is, is the answer. You haven't yet rebutted the indictment, have you? No, I haven't. Well, there you go. That's, your, that's once you revoke the power of your attorney, that's your next step. Yep. Once that's out of the way, dismiss the case. Okay? Uh, Frank, should yep. I use that particular document with the rejection notice, turn it into an exhibit, and then create one of their court forms to move it into the court? Um, like we've been doing with other stuff? Yeah, good, great question, because I actually had this uh, question asked of me in uh, a matter here in Australia. The court record... Um, the court record is... Uh, the or the docket um, is the workings of the case, but that itself is secondary to the physical... Um, this, okay, <clears throat> let, me, let me say. It is easy to get confused between two concepts, public record and public notice. 
they're quite distinct, even though in their system they confuse and deliberately confuse us between the two. Would you agree? Yep, they do. Okay. You have a requirement to do both as an executor, okay? Mm -hmm. The conversion of the instrument into an exhibit is a form of public record, yeah? Yeah, it is. But public notice is also warranted, yeah? Well, the public notice would be the recording of the notice of rejection on the docket. Yes, but I, I, I would also look to see how you communicate that to them as well. I'll leave it up to you okay. because it's worth exploring, but... We, you know, we we will be identifying in our own system very clearly that there are specific, for example, public notice ultimately is a is a, in their system uh, there there is a procedural public notice which is notorial public notice and constructive notice, and then there is literal public notice which is gazettes. Yeah, right. They accept both. One is extraordinarily long-winded, <laughs> timely, expensive. And the other one is getting it into the publisher and actually being allowed to publish. So we'll, we, we will be mirroring the two. But uh, on your answer, Ron, yeah. good point. If a summons and an indictment are the two uh, forms of action that follow the cause of action, uh, then I would, or, or that create the cause of action, I would, I would suggest that they must be rebutted in order to move forward. Well Great. Done. Thanks, Frank. Okay. Bye. See you. We've got a few more minutes, and I just uh, invite anyone who does want to speak live, please um, press star eight, and we'd love to speak with you. Um, I've got a couple more questions here on the chat, uh, and then we uh, get to the next caller, the next few callers. Uh, the question is uh, from uh, Yoda Lay Hu. Uh, very nice uh, sounding <laughs> handle. Uh, the question is, what are your thoughts on appealing a foreclosure months after an eviction? Um, firstly, an appeal by definition is an acknowledgement, and, and that word is very important, it is an acknowledgement uh, that obviates any of the previous mistakes done in the process um, at a principal level. So an appeal you're recognising jurisdiction, an appeal, you're recognising their um, claims of right and authority, but an appeal is then appealing a technical aspect, uh, a severity of sentence, really a limited window of claim. So I'd suggest to you, well, in some cases, an appeal may be, may be valid and warranted because there was some clear miscarriage but I would say in most cases of foreclosure, uh, an appeal will result in uh, no effect. That's my instant kind of feel for the question of appealing. Um, because as we just spoke, built into their presumptions of law, your title in common, your tenancy in common, really gives you absolutely no right. I mean, you are literally behold into their system. If they want to kick you off the land and go after you for the, the debt, then if you look at their statutes, they're perfectly within their rights to do that. So unless you challenge the presumptions from a principal's position, uh, I, I think uh, the appeal process in a foreclosure matter gives very little room for any kind of remedy. Uh, so anyway, that's my feeling. Uh, please, I uh, welcome anyone to correct me if you feel that I've missed something there. Um, let me go and have a look at um, the next question here. Uh, the question is, uh, will we be able to do the, the will and uh, rebuttal of intestate soon? Uh, JZ7, yes, but I just need a few more days to consolidate the great work that you've all shared uh, to get up onto the court sites. I've made a priority of the workbenches, which is why the focus has been on getting the workbenches turned on very soon before we go back to the physical documents. Uh, I see we've got East Pennsylvania on the